Holy Spirit have his way in our life. Can we do that together? Let's pray. Father, we love you. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for that Holy Spirit, Lord, and being present with us this morning, Lord. We just thank you for your mercy and your grace, Lord, that you bestow upon us every day, Father. We love you this morning. We thank you for this, this great privilege and opportunity to be in your house, Father. And, Lord, I just pray, God, that, Lord, if there be one here today, Lord, is just struggling with something, in their life, Lord. They just turn it over to you before they leave this place today. Lord, you are a great and mighty Savior. Lord, we lift all those up been mentioned on the prayer list this morning, Lord, the ones that are sick. Father, the ones that's lost loved ones. Lord, I pray that you comfort as only you can, Father. Lord, I love you today. I just ask for that fresh anointing now as we sing your praises, Lord. And as the preaching hour comes, Father, I pray that you just, Lord, use us in a mighty way this morning. We love you and we thank you, Lord. This ain't pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
that you go to meet every Lord and you do us your will. We just thank you for just being there for us, Lord, even though we're not, Lord. Thank you for everything on earth to have in this holy name.
Boy, I tell you, when you really sit and think about that thought of what a Savior, man, that's just mind-boggling, isn't it? Your mind just does not wrap around that thought of somebody willing to die for you. Somebody didn't even know. You weren't even born. You weren't even in existence. But he knew you, and he died for you so that you could live. I just, I'm telling you, the more I think about that, the more it blows my mind. Have you ever had a week where you just really, well, I'm telling you, I mean, you had to lean on him. I mean, everything in you had to lean on him. You know what? That really makes a difference in your whole thought process when you really, really had to lean on him. You know, this week, this week, it's been just one of those weeks. It's just a lot of different stuff going on, a lot of different things going on. And it was a first for me this week, as Wednesday, we had a double funeral. I'd never done a double funeral. Had no idea how to do a double funeral. And it's one of those days when you get up Wednesday morning, for lack of a better term, sick as a dog. Your allergies has got a hold of you. You can't hardly talk. Your throat's full. Your head's full. And to be honest with you, I was sharing this with Mr. Carl the other day. It's one of those days you just really want to just lay down. I, that morning I got up and, and I knew. I said, boy, it's going to be a tough day. I really just want to lay down. Lord, I, I, I'm dependent on you today. I got, I'm, I'm just going to be 100% dependent on you today, as I should be every day. But you know what? He brought me right on through. He carried me right on through till that night. And you know what? Then I got to lay down. But that's what he does. In the simplest things of life and in the hardest turmoils of life, that Savior that loves us is right there for us to hold us up. When we're at our weakest, he's at his best. Amen. Amen. And uh, this passage of Scripture that I want to share with you this morning, I tell you, I've been through this passage, and it's just been rolling in my mind and rolling in my mind and rolling in my heart, and I'm thinking, Lord, how in the world are we going to preach this? He said, just hang on, I'll show you. And it's one of those deals you start hanging on wondering, when's he going to show me? He said, you just hang on, I'll show you. So through all the events of this past week, through everything that's taken place, he showed me. And I love it when he does that. Back to the book of Colossians. And, and the songs go right with the message this morning. I, God just does that, okay? I was laughing, June. I almost got a little carried away because when Miss Barbara gave me the prayer list, part of your song was on the back. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking, yeah. It makes you want to shout just a little bit. But in this passage of Colossians, it's a continuance of what we saw last week. Of being rooted and built up, rooted like a tree, built like a house, maintained, established and taught like we are in school. But this next passage has got some wording in it that you really need to understand. Colossians in that second chapter, over in verse 13, it says this, listen. And you being dead in your sins and, uns and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. What a Savior. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, Look at this, church. You've got to see this. That was against you. Which was contrary to us. And took it out of the way. Nailing it to the cross. Nailing it to the cross. You see that? And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly triumphing over them 
in it. You see that? Did you see that, church? When you see that passage of Scripture, did you really understand how important this passage of Scripture is to you as a child of God? Or as a lost person sitting here today, I want you to understand the importance of this passage of Scripture because if you're lost in your sins, as Paul reminds the church they were at one time right here, I want you to understand something. You don't have to be. You don't have to be. He starts this passage out, and he, remember he's reminding this church at Colossae, these people that he's never met, the people that's never met him, he's reminding them of how to stand against false teachers and false doctrines. He's reminding them how to stand against the ones that want to throw them off track. And church, I'm telling you, in the day we live in today, you hear me say this a lot, we have to understand these scriptures so that we don't get thrown off track. Because it's so easy to do. You want to get thrown off track? You can watch five minutes of the news and be so far off track it ain't even funny. But in this passage of Scripture, Paul uses some words right here. He says, and you, and you. Can I tell you something? I want you to read that, and it don't get any more personal than that right there. It does not get any more personal than that right there because it says, and you. That makes it one-on-one -on -one personal with us, right? And you being dead. You see that? Being dead. What does that mean? You say, well, preacher, I ain't dead yet. You were when you were lost in your sins. You were dead and headed to a devil's hell. Think it's hot out there now? Wait till then. You were dead in those sins that had caused you to be separated from Christ. And Paul wanted to bring that to their remembrance to understand this is where Christ brought you from. You were not only dead in your sins, you weren't of the same circumcision as the Jews, you were totally separated, but God brought you through, and that word quickened means he made you alive in him. Amen. You, do you see that? He made you alive in him. Some of y'all saying, I'm still dead. <laughs> I, I, I ain't going to be made alive. He quickened you. He brought you up from a place you could not bring yourself from. He made a way for you when you could not make a way for yourself. He brought you out of your sin and made you alive. You know, I begin to think about that. And I begin to read and look at that. And I begin to think about that day of salvation. Y'all remember your day of salvation? I hope you do. I hope you remember that day. And I, you remember after that day, after that Christ came in and made you alive and brought you out of that place of death that you were, and, and everything looked different. It, it was brighter. It was greener. It was alive, wasn't it? Why? Because you had been dead and were made alive and saw things in a different facet. You saw it in a different way. It smelled different. Did you know new growth and death have a whole different smell? Did you know that? New growth has a bright, vibrant smell that changes your senses and you say, Oh, that smells good. When a garden starts to grow and you get out there in that garden and you walk around and those plants begin to come up and they, they begin to bloom, they have a smell to them, don't they? They smell like new. Isn't that good? But you walk in somewhere where something's been dead a while. I'm going to tell you something. It ain't got that fresh smell. And if you, ever, if you say, well, preacher, I need something to jog my memory. You come with me one day, I'll show you. I got a place you can go and you stick your face in it, and I guarantee you, you'll smell death in a hurry. You say, I remember that, preacher. I remember how that new growth comes. But Paul is reminding them here, listen, he's reminding them not only that he's brought them out of death, he, he, he's quickened them, he's made them alive, and listen to this, church, this, this, everything behind them, everything in their past, Everything they had done, everything that was holding them, everything that was bringing them down, listen to me, church, when I say this, was blotted out. 
It was blotted out. His sins, their sins were forgiven them. As Psalms teaches, as far as the east is from the west, it was not there anymore. And the only way in those days to blot something out, because everything was written in hard parchment or stone, was to take a hammer and a chisel and rewrite the words. Let me tell you what God did. When he brought you out of death, he quickened you and made you alive. He pushed out all the things that were contrary to him, all the things that were pushing you away. He blotted all of that out and made you new. He made you new. He's reminding the church of this so that they can understand all this when the teachers start coming and telling them. When Satan starts coming. Satan never come to you and tell you, ah, oh, that ain't true. You're still just as bad as you always were. You're still in your sin like you always were. You're still lost. That's all a hoax. That's not any good. That's not what the scripture teaches. And he goes on and he says, we're going to blot it out. Everything that was against us, that was contrary to us, that was our enemy, he has blotted it out. Nailing it. Look at this. You've got to get the wording right in this passage. Nailing it to his cross. We sang a verse in that song a while ago that said, He took sin and made it his. Did you hear, did you hear that? Boy, I about shouted when we sung that. He took all the sin and made it his. He took all your sin and made it his and nailed it to the cross of Calvary. The past, the present, and the future. And he made it his. Now you think about that for just a minute. And I'm going to tell you something. When he was nailed to the cross of Calvary, when he sat there, he was nailed there as a human. He was nailed there in his flesh to take on all that sin. And nothing could shake him loose from that cross, not even Satan. As he hung there on that cross with the nails in his hands and the nails in his feet, he hung there with every sin, but those nails was not what held him there. It was the sin nails of all the generations that kept him on that cross of Calvary. Amen. The sin nails of all creation kept him on that cross of Calvary. And I, can I tell you something? Even through the earthquake, as he began to give up the ghost, as the scriptures teach over in Matthew, even when the veil rent from the top to the bottom, when the earth got dark, when the earth shook, nothing was going to take him off of that cross because the sin nails held him on there. Your sin nails. Your sin nails. You thought, yeah, he's old. Preacher, don't, don't make it personal. Your sin nails held him there. Praise God for that. That he was willing to take those nails. Your nails. The ones you should have been nailed to that cross with. He was willing to take them for you. All the past. All the present. And all the future. What a reminder that is. What a thought process that is. What, what, how we need to apply that to our life every single day. See, we don't think about that. In our day -to -day, seriously, in our day-to-day -day life, do we ever think about that? How our sin nails held him on the cross. And can I tell you something? He was not coming off of that cross until God sent his men to take him off that cross and put him in the grave. But you know what? When his body was taken off that cross, those nails stayed there. That sin stayed on the cross. He didn't go to the grave with him. He didn't ascend to heaven with him. Your sins are still today nailed to that cross of Calvary. Amen. So you take the cross out of anything. And you took Jesus out. You see, see the importance of that? We're going we're to get to the message in a minute. This just got me excited, okay? I can't help it. Do you see that? Do you see the importance of that in our life? Do you see why it's so important to need Jesus and lean on him every day for every bit of strength that you have? you got to have him. can't survive without him. You see that? Because had he not went to the cross, 
and he had not nailed it to the cross, you'd still be lost. But you know what? You can't read that passage. I, I'm telling you. In my, let me rephrase that. In my personal life, I cannot read that passage without a verse coming to my mind. A verse of song. Listen to this. You're going to love this. And we sing it. And I see you sometimes get excited when we sing it. But we're going to show you something this morning. Listen. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross. Bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my sin. You've heard that verse. You sang that verse. But have you ever really thought about that verse? My sin. My imperfection. My separation. my comfort, my peace that I had none of when I was in my sin. <coughs> everything that separated me from God, everything that had me bound and headed to a devil's hell, everything in that was my sin. And church, I'm going to tell you something. You really want a life in Jesus today, you really want to know a life in Christ today, you need to take ownership of your sin. I can't take ownership of your sin. I can only take ownership of mine. And when I take ownership of mine, I turn it over to my Savior because it's my sin. I can't look at you and take ownership of yours. You have to do that. And you know what? Here's the thing. Listen to this. When we've got sin between us and the Father, when my sin is between me and the Father, it clouds everything around me. I can't see clearly. I can't see straight. I have no vision. I have no walk. All I have is my sin that's got me separated. You see the importance of that? See why the, the writer of that song could sing that song? My sin. But listen to this. You look that word bliss up. The dictionary is going to give you this definition. I love you're going to like this, okay? Complete happiness. You say, well, preacher, you've told us many, many times happiness comes and goes, joy stays forever. That's exactly right. But I'm going to tell you something. The bliss of your sin being gone puts you in a state of complete happiness. Every time you think about it, it puts you in a state of complete happiness. You know what some other words for bliss were? Now, this is in the dictionary now. You're going to like it, I'm telling you. Some other words for bliss, paradise, heaven, kingdom come, new Jerusalem, and Zion. That's the other words for bliss out of the Webster's Dictionary. I put some smiles on some faces. Listen, they couldn't find no other way to define bliss outside of my Jesus. Don't get y'all excited. They could find no way to define bliss outside of God's word. They could find no way to define bliss outside of a relationship with my Savior. My sin, all oh, the complete happiness that comes into my heart when I think about paradise with my Jesus. You see that, Pat? You see how important that is today? See, and you're, somebody's sitting here going, I can't think about that, preacher. You can before you leave. Think about that for a minute. 
Let that sink in for just a minute. This is one of them feel good messages this morning, okay? Y'all stay on me all the time. My sin, oh, the bliss. Oh, the paradise kingdom, come, take me home now. I'm ready for New Jerusalem. <laughs> it's everything of God. <clears throat> it was nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. None of it. None of it. person wallows in their past sin, listen to me, if a person wallows in their past sin, it's their fault. It's not God's fault. It's not my Savior's fault. It's their own fault. Because you do not have to tote that sin. Because why? He nailed it to the cross. That burden of that sin was nailed to the cross. If you tote it, it's your fault. I don't like that, preacher. I like my sin and I want to keep it because that keeps a burden on me. I'm going to tell you something. There's a bad burden and a good burden. A bad burden is when you tote your sin and it's got you so burdened and separated from God that nothing can move forward. You don't have to tote that one. A good burden is when that burden is on you for the ones that are around you that you want to share the gospel with and there's a fire burning in you like was in Jeremiah over there. He says, I've got to share the gospel with everything I have. I've got to share my God. I'm burdened for the ones that are around me. That's a good burden. You say, I don't want neither one of them. You're going to have one or the other. And what I'm starting to see in some folks around here, I'm starting to see folks starting to lay down those burdens that were holding them back, and they're starting to be burdened for the ones that are around them because they want everybody to know Jesus the way they do. Right. Why? Because it makes a difference in your life. The whole thing, nothing left out. All of my sin was nailed to that cross. Not only that, listen to this. He spoiled the principalities and the powers openly. He triumphed over Satan right there. Satan thought he had a victory won right there. Y'all know that? Satan thought he had a victory won, but guess what? He didn't. And you know what? The outcome of that victory that Jesus had right there at that cross of Calvary, when Satan was defeated right there, when death, hell, and the grave was defeated right there, that will live forever. That's you. That's your future in your Savior. Why? Because all your sins were nailed to that cross. I don't know how any more plain to put it. And that's up to you how that affects your life. Did you know that? It's up to you how you take this. And it's up to you how you apply this to make your life better. Because here, can I tell you what happens in a life today? Listen, we'll take it. And we'll say, okay, man got saved. Come know Christ. Oh, Jesse up here, he got saved. All on him, man. He's got saved. He's got it all. Ain't nothing else. He's gone as far as he can go. He's got saved. Salvation is the beginning. Did you know that? Right. Salvation is the beginning of eternity. We start living eternity right here on this earth in everyday fashion. Why? Because our sins were nailed to the cross. And every time we think about that, we get excited. I'm living my eternity now. What? I got to live like this the rest of my life? Nope. But in your relationship with him, you start learning. You start learning how it's going to be over there. What's it going to be like? I've told you this before. I, I, I don't have a clue other than what the scriptures teach me what it's going to be like over there. I don't know. I just know I want to go. 
And I just know the only way to get there is through Jesus Christ. But when I think about this passage today, what holds the church down today? What binds the church today? What's keeping the church in a place of non-movement today? We don't understand this passage. We don't understand the bliss of our happiness. We don't understand all of our sins being nailed to the cross. We don't understand that we don't have to live in bondage anymore. We don't understand why, how we can live a life abundant. We don't understand those things. Why? Because we're not in this passage. We don't, we don't wrap it around our mind and live in it every day. Every day. You're going to have good days and bad days. Did you know that? There's not a person in this room, I don't care what age you are, from this big to the oldest one here, you're going to have good days and you're going to have bad days. But can I tell you something? My Savior is the same every day. He never changes. On my worst days, he's right there for me. On my best days, he's right there for me. You say, wait a minute. He's there all the time? All the time. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. And he excites you. He excites you. When you come through a bad day and the next day's a better day, can I ask you a question? Who do you give credit to? Well, I feel better today because I took Musin X D last night. <laughs> and it's got all that stuff loosened up, and I, I'm having a better day. No, you're having a better day because Jesus allowed you to have a better day. Amen. So be quick to give him praise. Be quick to say, Lord, how good you are to me. How good you are to me. That's what Paul's reminding. He's reminding the church here, you've got to remember these basic things. You've got to take these basic things and apply them and hang on to them because I want you to know that through Jesus, there is bliss. There's, that's a word we never use, is it? We never use that word. And you had no idea of all the heavenly words that went with that. We just sing it and get excited because it sounds good when we sing it. But when it's nailed to the cross, that's finished. Jesus said, hanging on the cross of Calvary, it is finished. He finished it right there. So we sit here today. Now it's up to us. Now it's up to you. Now it's up to me what I'm going to do with this passage. How am I going to apply this to my life? How am I going to use this to make me better? You said, well, give me the answer. I don't know. I know how I'm going to try to use it in my life. But how are you going to use it? Last night, we went up helped uh, the Buffalo Men's Ministry at a church at Chapel Hill in Bremen. We had to help them serve a wild game dinner last night. Well, this is a great group. They have about 14, 15 men in this ministry. And they, they've lost a few. But these men, man, they work year-round doing different fundraisers. And they raise money. And here's what their money goes to. Shop with a cop in the CCC to help us with Christmas. I mean, they raised a good bit of money through the year to help with those things. So the question was asked last night. Well, I didn't know where they got their name from. Buffalo Men's Ministry. Where did you come up with the name Buffalo? They were at a men's meeting one night. They were at a group meeting. And one of them had watched a documentary he said, let me tell you about a buffalo. June was sharing the same thing this morning. They said, a buffalo 
won't leave one of their own. If one of them's wounded, they'll circle around it, they'll stand around it, and they'll protect it. If a lion attacks or something attacks, wolves attack one, they come back, and as a group, they'll fend that wolf off, and they'll protect that one that's hurt until that one's well again. They never leave each other. <coughs> they travel in a herd. They travel in a pack if that's what you want to call it. And they look out for one another to help keep each other safe. I thought, wow, that's a pretty good name for a men's ministry. Y'all don't name y'all's men's ministry today. But when you think about that, and you think about this passage of scripture right here, if we had a group of people, it's just proposing, it's hypothetical. What if you had a group of people that realize their sins were nailed to the cross. They realize that sometimes one or two of them may get a little weak sometimes and the other ones need to rally back and circle around them and help them up sometimes. Instead of judging them and telling them how bad they are, kind of hold them accountable and help them up and bring them back in and protect them a little bit. Because you know what? Their sins were nailed to the cross just like yours were. And if we come to a place right there and we said, hey, we're going to move in this mentality and we're going to move in this passage of Scripture and we're going to know bliss not only in our individual lives, we're going to know it together as a corporate group. Why? Because we're going to trust the Savior with everything we have. We're going to understand that He's blotted out not just my sins, not just my transgressions, not just my iniquities. He's blotted out yours too if you've accepted Him as a Savior. We're going to understand that if we run a little bit more in a pack mentality and I'm telling you, protect each other a little bit, it'll make this world a whole lot better. And can I tell you something? It'll make this church a whole lot better. Right. When we look out for each other, instead of uh, throw each other under the bus. And with that being said, look around you and see who's missing this morning. Look around you and see who's not here this morning. Yeah, I wonder where they was. Well, you know what? Why don't you give them a call tomorrow and say, hey, we missed you. Hope you're all right. Is everything okay? You see, when this passage of Scripture affects our life, we want everybody to have this. We want everybody to live in this. I want everybody to live in victory. Y'all love victory, don't you? When Jesus defeated Satan, what? There's no greater victory. There will be no greater victory. Ever won, I don't care what football team you watch, baseball team, whatever, there will never be another triumph any greater than what this triumph was right here. Now, here's the thing. You'll get all this. I know football season's coming up. My y'all say, boy, I'm getting ready to get it on. But I'm going to tell you something. Your opponent, old Satan, is still out there, and he knows that he can't win this whole nine yards, but he knows he can win a few little battles out there. We need to get our mentality set. I know this battle's on. My Jesus already won, and guess what? Through the power of the blood, I'm going to win too. Amen. Amen. Not only that, I'm going to watch out for the ones that are around me. I'm going to watch out for the ones I love. And when I see them take a few defeats, guess what? I'm going to lift them up. I'm going to get to where they are. I'm going to circle around them. I'm going to pick them up because I want to see them win too. If we want to see people win, rather than, you know what? This is sad. Part times in the church, we don't want to see people lose. You say, what, preacher? Part time in the church, people want to see people lose so they can say, I told you. Now, how sad is that? Would Jesus do that? What if Jesus had looked at you and said, I want to see them lose? I want to see them lose. What if it had got almost to the cross and said, this is as far as I'm going, because I want to see 
them lose. Where would you be today? Boy, you'd be in trouble, wouldn't you? You say, wait a minute, preacher, what happened to that feel good message? He nailed it to the cross so that you could know bliss, you could know heaven, you could get there. Not only that, to show you the triumph over the tomb, not only that, to show you triumph over the things of this world that will drag you down, not only that, to show you triumph in your life. I don't care how many struggles you go through. In Jesus Christ, there will always be a triumph in your life. The worst day that you'll ever have in him, you'll have a triumph. That's all you got to do is look to that and say, yes. Yes. I'm having a bad day, but he's still on the throne. Yes. This day has wore me down completely, physically, emotionally, spiritually, but he's still on the throne. Yes. A great triumph. There's a few frowns starting to grin a little bit as I look across the, the, the room here today. Some of y'all going, I want to know a little bit about that bliss. I want to know a little bit about that place, that triumph. How do you get that stuff knocked out? I want to know this Savior. You can't lose your salvation. You're born again, child of God, and you've accepted Christ, you'll never lose that. But you can't lose the enthusiasm of your salvation. That's what Paul's teaching the church right here, the enthusiasm. Here's where he's brought you to. The victories that come with it are yours. Jesus' victory is your victory. Did y'all know that? You finally won something. We were up at that dinner last night. Man, they was giving away one of them pretty Benelli shotguns. I thought, oh, I want that. <laughs> so I went over to the raffle table. I thought I want a ticket on that shotgun. He said, okay. He said, I said, now, is this the winning ticket? <laughs> and he said, why, yes. Yes, it is. I said, that's the one I want. I don't want just any ticket. I want the winning ticket. <laughs> that rascal lied to me. <laughs> <laughs> and by the time it was all over with, I couldn't find him. He was already gone. <laughs> <laughs> you see, on that, you took a chance. There's no chance in my God. You don't have to go and purchase a ticket and hope that it's the winning ticket. Because when you accept him and he nailed that sin to the cross, everything in him is a winner. Everything in him is a winner. You don't have to wonder with your ticket, looking, waiting on that number to be called. Because there is no falsehood in him. So this morning, listen to me. Listen to me this morning. You might be here this morning. Listen, you just you struggle a little bit. Say, Preacher, there's some things in my life that are just beating me down. They are beating me down beyond all reason. It's hard to see up. First and foremost, I hope you know that you know Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. If you don't know that today, listen to me, church. If you don't know that today, and that Holy Spirit speaking to you this morning saying you need to come to Christ today. You need to come to where he is today. You need to be completed in him today. You need to understand that your sins were nailed to that cross and accept him. Today is that day. You don't have to struggle with that anymore. But you may be here today and say, Preacher, I struggle daily in my relationship because I, I, I don't see it this way. I don't see it in this passage. I don't see it nailed to the cross. I just see my day-to-day -day life. And I know in my day-to-day -day life, I get beat down. You and everybody else. 
he's still right there. The triumph, the victory is still right there. All you got to do is see it. His triumph is your triumph every day. You say, preacher, I, I've been really struggling with the ones around me. Instead of lifting them up to you, I don't pass my judgment on them. nothing in your life today that he can't help. I don't care what it is. He can help. So this morning, as you stand with us, as they come with a song, 65. as the Lord begins to deal with hearts, and let, let me urge you in this, let me urge you in this, move quickly. Move quickly this morning, because let me tell you what, Satan will get a hold of you, and he'll hold you right there in that pew if you don't move quickly. When that Holy Spirit's moving, go then. Go right now. Because you say, I need to go right now. Not tomorrow. Not in a little bit. Right now. I need to move right now. As they sing this morning. Yeah. 